Hello Calc 3, welcome back to another video. Um, this video is intended to be a review of some different topics from chapter 13 and 14 because a student requested it, so I'm happy to do it. Um, we want to cover tangent vectors and curvature from section 13.4, and then we want to cover directional derivatives and gradients from section 14.5. And really the goal of the video is to distinguish between the two concepts. So we've defined all kinds of different things over the past couple weeks in chapter 13 and chapter 14. And this video um, should hopefully give you enough of an intuition for these different topics that you're comfortable distinguishing between them. You know the differences. Uh, you understand them well enough on a conceptual level that you don't get confused with all of the different kinds of definitions. So that's the goal. Um, and to do so, we're going to start off by just talking about curvature, reviewing what it is, hopefully building an intuition for it, and then contrasting it with the idea of a gradient or a directional derivative from section 14.5. <clears throat> so intuitively, curvature is going to describe the rate at which a curve is changing direction at a particular point. Um, so we can define some curve to be parametrized in space or in the plane, possibly even a higher dimension. And curvature is ultimately going to give us a way to, uh, to talk about how much the curve is turning or bending. And to do so, we're going to appeal to the tangent vector of the curve at different points. Um, so notice that the concept of curvature applies to curves in the plane or curves in space, as we talked about in chapter 13, and possibly even curves of higher dimension if you wanted to generalize and make it more of an abstract concept. Um, for us, curvature applies only to vector-valued functions. So remember that a vector-valued function is a function where you plug in some real number or some real parameter t, and the function is going to output a a vector in however many dimensions. So it could be a vector in two dimensions, three dimensions, maybe even higher if you wanted to. Um, the, the function that I have drawn here or that I have um, written down here, R of T is a function that, that pops out a three-dimensional vector. But notice that we could also represent that vector valued function with three parametric equations. So we have uh, X is equal to X of T, Y is equal to Y of T, and Z is equal to Z of T where x of t, y of t, and z of t are, we called them the component functions of the vector valued function r. And uh, down below here, I have a picture of a couple of different curves. Uh, the first one on the left is drawn in the plane, and then on the right, we have a curve drawn in space. So the curve on the left would correspond to a vector valued function that outputs two dimensional vectors. Uh, the curve on the right corresponds to a vector valued function that outputs three dimensional vectors. Uh, and if you don't want to think about them as vectors per se, you could also think about the function as taking in a real number and outputting um, coordinate points. So the R of T that I have written above takes in a real number, it outputs um, an ordered triple that describes a point in space. And as we change T, that T is going to trace out a curve, or R of T will trace out a curve. So you can notice that both of the curves that I have drawn have a direction given to them that depends on the parameterization we choose for the curve. Um, and the red arrows inside of both of the sketches here will represent the velocity vector at each red point. So remember that the velocity vector uh, can also be given as the derivative of R of T, and the velocity vector will always be tangent to the curve. But the velocity vector might have different magnitudes at all of these different red points that I've chosen along both of the curves. And the magnitude of the velocity will depend on the parameterization. So if I'm moving along the curve faster with respect to my parameter t, then the uh, the magnitude of my velocity vector will be different depending on how fast I'm moving. Um, which makes sense with the notion of speed as we've defined it. So remember that speed is uh, defined to be the magnitude of the velocity vector at different points. And if I choose different parameterizations where say I'm moving, fa I'm moving faster along my curve, uh, then it would make sense that the magnitude of the velocity vector would be different because my speed is going to be different, right? Um, but the direction of the velocity 
does not depend on the parameterization that we choose. So regardless of which parameterization we choose, we're always going to get a velocity vector that's parallel to the ones that I have drawn. Um, so if we want to disregard the magnitude of the velocity and only talk about the direction of the curve at a particular point, we can define the unit tangent vector, t, uh, which is equal to v over the absolute value of v because we want to get rid of the issue of the magnitude of the velocity that depends on the parameterization. So the direction, this v over the magnitude of v, will not depend on the parameterization that we choose. And once we define uh, this unit tangent vector this way, then we can think about what this expression here means. So what does the absolute, or I should say the magnitude of the derivative of the unit tangent vector with respect to t mean? Um, well, the derivative of the unit tangent vector with respect to t will give us the rate of change of the direction of the curve as we travel along the curve with respect to our parameter t. And um, the fact that we're talking about the magnitude just means that it's going to tell us the magnitude of the change. Basically, how quickly is, um, how quickly is the unit tangent vector changing direction? That's what we're interested in here. But notice that um, we're talking about how quickly the unit tangent vector is changing with respect to the parameter t. And depending on what parameterization we choose, what t we choose, uh, this magnitude can be different, but we don't want it to be different. Um, we want curvature to be independent of the parameterization that we choose. So uh, we're ultimately going to make it look like the rate of change of the unit tangent vector with respect to the arc length parameter, or with respect to the distance that we've moved along the curve, which is where we get this definition for curvature. So down here at the bottom, curvature is defined to be the magnitude of the change in the unit tangent vector with respect to the distance that we're traveling along the curve. And this allows curvature to be independent of uh, the parameterization that we choose because it's defined to be independent of that parameterization. So hopefully that gives a little bit of a better intuition uh, as to what curvature is. If you look up at these red velocity vectors on the pictures that I have drawn, the curvature is a way to describe how much those velocity vectors are changing from point to point. And the, the curvier your curve is, the more change you're going to have. Uh, the straighter your curve is, the less change you're going to have. And so the smaller your curvature will be. So now that we have an intuition for curvature, we have a little bit of a review there. Let, we can move on to directional derivatives and gradients now and talk about why these concepts are very, very different. Um, so notice that all of the concepts we've talked about up until this point were defined for vector valued functions. Again, those are functions that I have listed down here, functions where you are taking a single parameter t or a single real number and you plug it into the function and the function is going to output a vector. So it's going to output lots of information. You can think about it as an ordered pair or ordered triple, um, but the point is it's going to give you a bunch of different coordinates that are popping out. A multivariable function is essentially the opposite of a vector valued function. So the multivariable function takes in a bunch of information like multiple uh, coordinates or a point, and it's going to output one number, so a single number. Um, so again, a vector valued function takes in a single number and outputs lots of information like a vector in two or three dimensions or higher. A multivariable function uh, takes in lots of information, a point in, uh, in the plane or in space or in higher dimensions, and it outputs a single number. So these are kind of opposites of one another and they are fundamentally different kinds of functions. So things that we, that we define for vector-valued functions um, will likely not have any direct analog for multivariable functions. Um, and I should probably be careful about saying such a broad general statement like that. But the point is, there's not, um, there's not a super easy generalization from concepts for vector-valued functions over to multivariable functions and back and forth like that all the time. 
maybe sometimes there are, but you'll see that the, the fact that these are two completely different kinds of functions is why gradients and directional derivatives are very different ideas um, from curvature and unit tangent vectors and normal vectors from chapter 13. So gradients and directional derivatives are only interesting for functions of two or more variables, right? So gradients and directional derivatives will only be defined for multivariable functions, not for vector value functions. But more than just that, they're really only interesting when we have a function that takes in uh, more than one variable and then outputs a real number. So why is that the case? Well, if we had a single variable function, like from calc one, something like y equals f of x, so we're taking one real number, outputting one real number, um, then remember that the gradient is the vector that we get when we take the partial derivatives with respect to each of the variables that's inputting into our function. But if we only have one variable x, that's an input for our function, then the only quote unquote partial derivative that we have is dy dx. It's just the ordinary derivative. So if you want to somewhat abuse the concept of a gradient and try and generalize it to single variable functions, um, I think that it's appropriate to say the analog for the gradient for a single variable function is literally just the ordinary derivative. It's just dy dx. And for that reason, Gradients are really only interesting for functions of two or more variables. Otherwise, we would just kind of end up with our regular calculus from, uh, from Calc 1 and Calc 2. So let's talk about specifically functions in two variables now, just because they were significantly easier for me to draw. Um, so if we have some function in two variables, and instead of calling it, I don't want a W here. I actually want a Z there, because I think that it's more graphically intuitive. So for functions of two variables, um, and I'm going to call this specific one f of x, y is equal to z, the function describes a surface in space, not a curve in space. So remember that for, um, for curvature and the unit tangent vector, we were talking about curves that were drawn in space. Here we're talking about a two-dimensional surface as opposed to a one-dimensional curve in space. And the domain is going to be some region inside of the plane. So here I've just kind of chosen a domain for my function and then a surface that my function represents inside of space. So on the left, I have my domain in yellow. And then you can see the dome that I've drawn on the right in three dimensions there, um, or half of a sphere, either one would be fine. And I've picked a particular point in the domain of F and I've called it X naught, Y naught. And then if you look over to the, uh, the graph of the function on the right, you can see that I have my point down in the plane still, but my point is being projected up onto that surface where my third coordinate is given by the value of the function when I take the point and plug it in. And in this way, you can think about the function basically projecting a surface off of the plane up into three-dimensional space and all of my, now I have points in three dimensions that are defining this surface in, um, in three-dimensional space for the graph of my function here. And I also have a unit vector u, which I've drawn in the plane here. And this unit vector, if we're talking about directional derivatives now, this unit vector can give me the direction that I approach my point x naught y naught in the plane. And the direction that I choose is going to give me a different projection of a curve up onto the surface of my function in three-dimensional space. Um, it's really difficult for me to draw that, um, but let me see if I can give an idea of what I mean there. So let's say that I am, I have a vector way over here in the left, just so I can keep it separate from what's going on on the right side here with my point x naught, y naught. I have a vector, and this vector is not on the surface of my graph here. This vector is in the xy plane, and it's pointing in this direction. Well, if I take all of the points along this vector here, uh, or maybe I should call it a line segment, either one's really fine. Um, but if I take all of the points that are being represented by this vector here and I project them up onto my surface 
notice that I'm going to end up with a curve up on the surface, something like this. Maybe I made that a little bit too long. But as I'm going along my directional vector in the plane, all of those points are being projected up onto uh, the surface when I take those points and plug them into the function. And the directional derivative is going to give me the, the slope of the tangent line when I'm looking at that curve at some particular point. So let's say I have a point like here on the surface of my function then the tangent line would look like this with respect to this particular curve up on my surface. Um, and the directional derivative is going to be the slope of this tangent line. And uh, I have that drawn on the right as well. So we have this, this uh, point x naught y naught in the plane. It's projected up onto the surface by plugging it into the function f. And then if you you can take the tangent line that's in the direction of that directional vector u that I have drawn there, and it would look something like this vector that I have in purple here. And so ultimately the directional derivative is going to give us the slope of the tangent line in the plane on which we approach that point. Um, so hopefully that's a little bit of a better intuition as to what this directional derivative is. And now we can get into what the gradient is and talk about why we care about the gradient for multivariable functions. Um, so the gradient vector gives us the slope of the tangent lines in the x and y direction, specifically at a point uh, as a vector. So notice above, we talked about directional derivatives uh, in any direction inside of our region for our function. Um, from the point x naught y naught, but I think I said this in, um, in the video for section 14.5, the partial derivatives with respect to x and y are really just particular instances of directional derivatives where we are approaching the point x naught y naught in the x direction and then the y direction. So I have those unit vectors drawn here. And then if you look back over to the right where I have the surface that's kind of projected up into space for our function here, uh, if you look at the tangent lines as we approach the point in the y direction and the x direction, um, I have them drawn in purple and labeled. And um, the partial derivative with respect to x is going to give us the slope of that tangent line in the x direction. And the partial derivative with respect to y is going to give us the slope of that tangent line in the y direction, right? So ge geometrically, the intuition for the gradient vector is that the gradient vector at a specific point is going to give us as the i component for the vector, the slope of the tangent line in the x direction at the point. And for the j component of the vector, the slope of the tangent line in the y direction at a particular point, right? And so this definition for the gradient vector might seem somewhat arbitrary. And the reason is that the definition is pretty arbitrary. Um, we don't really care about it because it has some great geometric intuition to it. Um, so before for the tangent vector in chapter 13 or the unit tangent vector and curvature, um, the geometric intuition behind the ideas is stronger. Uh, I can kind of describe to you why you would define something in such a way um, because you already have an intuition of what curvature means. And so when we define it in that way, you say, oh yeah, that kind of makes sense. Curvature means turn in the curve. And I can see how you would describe that as the rate of change of a tangent vector to the curve. Um, but the gradient doesn't have nearly as strong of a geometric intuition. And ultimately, we define the gradient to be what it is because it's pragmatic. Um, because the, the gradient ends up being useful in calculating the directional derivative. And so we just gave it a name. And uh, to show that, I have this little derivation down here that I think I gave in the video for section 14.5. But this is why we define the gradient to be what it is for multivariable functions. It's because the gradient ends up being useful in calculating arbitrary directional derivatives. Um, so 
notice that uh, the directional derivative with or along the vector u of f at the point p naught, so this thing here is defined to be this. So we have the derivative of f with respect to the arc length parameter s um, along the unit vector u at the point p naught. And using the chain rule, that's going to equal this expression over here. Um, and I have noticed that u is equal to u1i plus u2j. And we could parametrize this unit vector u um, with the following parameterization. So we have x is equal to x naught for our point p naught plus s times u1 and y is equal to y naught plus s times u2 and if we parametrize in that way then dx ds is just going to equal u1 and dy ds is just going to equal u2 so you can actually take the derivative of these guys over here and find that that is the case you get u1 and u2 and once we get to this point we notice that we can write this as the dot product of two vectors. So this is written as the dot product where the, uh, the second vector in the dot product is just our vector u, and the first vector is something that just kind of naturally pops up, which we haven't talked about uh, before this point. At least when I introduced it in section 14.5, this is kind of a novel quantity that's showing up here. Um, and because it shows up in a point in such an influential point where it's um, it's so useful for calculating the directional derivative, we just give it a name. So we call it the gradient. Um, and so the gradient then ends up being uh, the vector where in the i component we have the partial derivative with respect to x, and in the j component we have the partial derivative with respect to y. And if I want to know what the gradient is at a particular point, then I'm going to evaluate uh, each of those partial derivatives at the point. And so the reason that the gradient is defined in this way is because of this expression, right? So it's not so much that, oh, the directional derivative, um, the directional derivative can be intuitively de described as the gradient dot product with the unit vector. It's more so that the directional derivative ends up being this thing right here, dot product with our unit vector and because this expression on the left of the dot product is going to show up so much we're going to give it a name and so we call it the gradient of f so geometrically the gradient is simply the vector formed by the slope of tangent lines in the x and y direction i think this is probably the strongest geometric intuition you can give for it um, and notice that the gradient is a vector in the plane it's not on the surface of our function. And for that reason, giving more geometric intuition is tough. We're not gonna end up with something like, oh, uh, the gradient vector ends up being normal to the surface uh, z is equal to f of x, y, um, because that's not the case. Really, as much as we can do here is say that uh, we end up finding that the gradient vector is always orthogonal to level curves of our surface, uh, which is somewhat surprising. It's kind of interesting that this is the case. Um, but again, this is an application of the chain rule. And I think I did give a derivation of that in section 14.5 or in the video for section 14.5. And we find out that the gradient is always going to be orthogonal to, um, to these level curves of our surface but the level curves are still going to be inside of the plane. So again, I've taken the same function down here. Uh, this is the surface in space corresponding to our function. And then here are some of the level curves, which would just be circles, depending on which uh, value for C you choose. And all we know about the gradient vector is that number one, the gradient vector is going to be in the plane. And if I pick some particular point uh, like x naught, y naught, or something like that, and it happens to be on this level curve here, then I know that the gradient vector at that point is going to be orthogonal. And uh, this might be why it seems like there's some kind of connection between normal vectors and gradient vectors. And um, there, there might be somewhat of a connection here because if I were to give the normal vector at this point, maybe I'll draw it in purple, the normal vector, if I'm just thinking about the curve, is going to look like 
this, right? So I know that the normal vector is also going to be orthogonal to the to the curve, but I think that this is really just um, I think this is really just somewhat of coincidence because we're talking about very different things here. So the gradient vector ends up happening to be um, orthogonal to these different level curves for our surface, but fundamentally the the gradient vector is defined. Uh, in terms of the function, in terms of the surface itself, and not in terms of the level curve. Whereas the normal vector here is defined to be the function that is orthogonal to the tangent vector of the curve. So the normal vector is given um, as some kind of property of the curve in space. The gradient vector is given as uh, some kind of property of a multivariable function, which happens to have a certain relationship to level curves of the function. So there are different, I think that there are just different concepts that might happen to have some similarities when you're looking at these level curves. Um, but other than that, I don't think they have too many similarities. So hopefully that was helpful going through um, the different concepts at, I think, more of a conceptual level as opposed to super rigorous. And um, I think ultimately my summary would be that the concepts are different because they are notions that we have developed or defined for different types of functions. Uh, curvature, unit tangent vector, uh, the normal vector, these are defined for vector valued functions that describe curves in planes or space. And the gradient and directional derivatives are notions of multivariable functions that we can graph as surfaces um, in space. And so hopefully that describes uh, the difference well enough for you. And I will be out um, or I'll be getting section 15.1 ready relatively soon and hopefully it'll be up on YouTube within the next few hours or something like that.